Okay, I think we are live. Um, I, I know I'm a few minutes early, but uh, I've got everything set up and looks like I'm good to go. So, might start here a few minutes early. Anyway, good evening from the Death Valley region of Eastern California. And I've got to shut off my speaker over here because, for some reason, the speaker turned on over there. All right, so. Um, as I said, good evening from the Death Valley region. Um, got a little bit of a breeze tonight that seems to be calming down. So I think we are uh, we're in pretty good shape. Um, wasn't supposed to be very much breeze tonight. It was supposed to taper off. And the last few minutes have been a little bit on the breezy side, but I think it's calming. So I think we're going to be good there. Um, I think one of the first things that I can do is uh, actually show you guys um, my setup. I don't often do do that and so um, let's see if I, uh, hmm, I can't tell if this is showing or not so I'll have to wait to see if it comes across in the uh, <coughs> in the stream. No it's not. Okay, why is this no longer working? Huh, that's interesting. Okay, well, never mind. Then I will just have to do this the old-fashioned way. And take it off my desktop. But uh, I, one of the things I haven't, haven't done in a while is um, kind of showed what, to, since I'm a few minutes early anyway, kind of show what my, my setup is. And um, let me bring that up here. Let me bring that up here. There we go. And then I can turn this off. All right. And that now you should be able to uh, see my uh, my little setup. So I'm using uh, a six-inch uh, f4 imaging Newtonian, uh, which is the little uh, the white telescope there on the, the top of the mount, and it's a simple reflector telescope. Um, that uh, works really well when you're using a camera. It's uh, it's uh, fast, fairly fast optics. In this case, called f4 or focal ratio of four, which means it collects light a bit faster than than a longer focal length telescope, which is good for a camera that's trying to hold the shutter open electronically or whatever to uh, to collect photons. And uh, the faster the scope, generally, the better it is for capturing images quicker. It collects light quicker than a slower, longer focal ratio, longer focal length scope. So this one is called an imaging Newtonian because it's an f4, which is fairly fast and uh, is ideal for use with cameras. And uh, you can see it's on the, the black mount there that's kind of uh, mounted at an angle is a Celestron Evolution mount. It's a regular alt as mount, altitude azimuth mount, so it moves simple side to side and up and down. And uh, it's on a uh, well, my homemade wooden wedge, and uh, obviously a homemade cinder block um, pier that stays permanently polar aligned. So the 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 base of the this is pointed directly at the arm, kind of the arm of the of the mount is pointed directly at Polaris, or our, our North Celestial Pole, actually, to be more accurate. So it rotates perfectly with the sky, because it's rotating in, on exactly the same polar axis as the sky, and so it's it tracks the sky much more accurately that way, again, for better imaging. <coughs> so that is the setup that I am using tonight, and uh, the camera I'm using is a, a ZWO ASI 533 color camera. And uh, that is what's going to be bringing us our images. Now, right now, what I'm doing is I am in this is a this is a piece of software called SharpCap, and uh, it is what controls the camera, collects the images, and even controls the telescope to some extent. And so that is what we are going to be using to um, control the scope and collect our images. And then Stellarium is what I am using to um, actually, it's a planetarium software that has all of the object in the sky, and I use it to actually send the telescope to the things that I want to send it to. 
And so uh, tonight we're going to be doing, uh, as I said, the Cloudy Nights January 2021 Observing Challenge, and uh, which is basically almost all the really cool objects right around Orion, which is the dominant constellation in our winter sky. And so um, that's where we're pretty much going to be tonight, is around all of that. And so let's see if I actually imported. I did not. I did not import. So I made a, um, let's see, desktop. I made an observation list of this for tonight. So we have a list of the objects for tonight. And uh, there's a few, and the, the, there's actually a few more that are in there. The biggest, brightest ones aren't actually in here yet. But um, let's, uh, uh, well, let's just start at the top. Let's just start with Running Man. <coughs> and we'll send the telescope there. And this is actually, the Running Man is actually the top star of the three stars in the sword of Orion. So neither one, uh, neither one of the top two is actually a star. The bottom one is actually a cluster of stars. The other two are, well, they're both clusters. They're all clusters of stars, but this one has a lot of nebulosity in it. And I think this is it down. Oh, no, that's probably M42. Okay, let's, yeah, that's 42. So what we want is right up here, M42. We'll take a look at that later. That's the Orion Nebula. The, uh, the running man, though, is up here. And so we're going to try and position the scope a little bit better to center on that. Bring it a little bit better to the center. And bring it back just a little bit. Bring it back just a little bit. Come on, you can do it. Move back, move back. There we go. Okay. Now for this one, um, the this object is a pretty bright object, so I'm probably going to do. We'll try it at about 16 seconds, and see if uh, see what we get for with 16 seconds because these objects here. Um, I know tonight I I wanted to do some fainter, more extended um, I wanted to do some longer exposure work tonight. But longer exposure stuff really needs to be on very faint stuff <laughs> because if you put that's yeah, it's actually not too bad it, uh, you want to do longer exposure stuff on really faint things because um, that's what really makes them brighter, holding that the proverbial shutter open longer is what makes things brighter. And so, oops, and I forgot to unstretch. This is actually one of the reasons why I want to uh, work with some of the sequences tonight. And so we're going to start doing that next. But this up here, this, this down here, ignore that for now, that's for later. No spoilers, um, but this this is uh, this is actually the Running Man up here. It's called the Running Man, which is a uh, uh, it's it's a the whole the whole region of uh, Orion is a star forming area, and so this is um, fairly new, bright, hot, blue white stars that are in a uh, that are starting to spread out as they've formed and they're starting to spread out into space and uh, they are illuminating the gases that helped form them so the gases that are still there still remaining that, that will over millions of years continue to coalesce and form new stars but before these stars move out of a gas cloud they illuminate it and uh, create what's called a reflection nebula and so that's what uh, 
That's what the Running Man is, is a reflection nebula. Hey, Al. Good to see you again. Welcome, welcome. I'm actually going to zip over to pull up Wikipedia and uh, NGC 1977 NGC 1977 It's a bright nebula that includes a reflection nebula located in the constellation Orion. It's northwest of the asteroids and known as the Orion Sword is the northernmost part, or the top of the, the top three stars in the asterism of the sword. <coughs> it's embedded, and popularly known as the Running Man Nebula. It's actually three different nebulae, according to the NGC catalog, that are divided by darker nebulous regions. It also includes the open cluster NGC 1981, which is the stars that are in it. It was discovered by William Herschel in 1786. <coughs> okay, now let me actually, I uh, need to set up a couple of things here that I forgot to do. Let's get those set up. Alright, let's see. As soon as that uh, image clears there, I will try and stretch this a little more. I seem to be getting, uh, all of a sudden, I seem to be getting a whole lot of noise in here. I'm not sure where it's coming from. Hmm. Let's see what happens. Come on, Let's see what happens if I push the stretch a bit. Oops, wrong button. There we go. Oh, and I need to put my light shroud on. Hold on a sec. Okay. Yeah, that would that just uh, wiggled it all out. I'm gonna have to kind of just reset, reset this, start over again. Because <coughs> I, I should have paused the, I should have paused the uh, exposures when I did that because it jiggled the scope. So we'll let it start over again and clean up a little bit. As I said, we are getting a little bit of intermittent breeziness tonight, so some of the uh, some of the images may be a little a little wonky. You can see already I've got some oval stars in here due to the uh, the scope jiggling around a little bit. Yeah, you can see the higher these numbers get the more fuzzy and blurred yeah see it rejected that one the more fuzzy and blurred the uh, 
the individual sub-exposures are. And so eventually if they get bad enough, it'll actually reject them, which is the case here. It just got a little bit of a breeze kicked up, and uh, so it caused the one of the subs to blur. Yeah, you can see I'm getting I'm getting oval stars now because the scope is blowing around. So if this uh, if this breeze continues, does not uh, does not abate. It may be a more limited evening than I was hoping for, but. We'll see what happens. In the meantime, though, I think you can see it's coming in pretty well. Divided by darker nebulous. Okay, so there's the three nebulous. It's made of three nebula different ones divided by the darker region so I'm assuming what that means is probably this upper region here and this middle part and then this bottom one which are being divided by the dark dust lanes running through them so they consider this to be three individual nebulae instead of just just one although most people just call the whole thing the running man <coughs> Although, nine, although, although one of the numbers, the number of the brightest part, NGC 1977, is used for generally the whole reflection nebula, <coughs> or the whole little complex in there, um, even though they are technically, according to the catalog, three different objects. Uh, most people just refer to it as one thing. of the running man shows up primarily in photographs. It's difficult to perceive visually through telescopes, though the reflection nebula itself is visible in small to medium apertures in dark skies. It is, it is a fairly bright object. Well, it's, it's the top star in Orion's sword, so, which can be seen naked eye, so it's going to be pretty good for uh, for any kind of um, amateur astronomy device, even binoculars, would be able to see it real well. So it's a pretty cool, it's a pretty fun amateur astronomer object, which unfortunately is being a little bit smudged and noised out tonight because of the because uh, of the breeze, but. See how my color balance is doing here. Yeah, color balance is off. Uh, color is off. Let's try that. Wow. All right. There we go. Hey, good evening. Thanks, guys. Thanks for showing up. Uh, Frank asks, Mike, do you take flats before each imaging session? The answer is yes. Or are you able to reuse them since you aren't changing your imaging train between sessions? Uh, Frank, I am using the same equipment each imaging session. However, I can't leave it set up. Uh, I can't leave my thing set up outside. It's just an outside um, it's an outside setup here. In fact, let me bring it back. So basically, it's this is sitting out in my yard on a cement pad, um, and the only thing that le le gets stays outside are the cinder blocks and the the wooden wedge, which stays permanently polar aligned. Everything else goes in at night. I don't leave the electronics or the scope or anything else, camera, whatever, outside. So um, even though I'm using the same equipment every night. Uh, because I am removing the camera and uninstalling things and then reinstalling it at the beginning of the session, uh, you have to take a different flat because even a slight change in the angle of the camera or 
uh, if the camera is slightly rotated from the last time you put it in, that changes the location um, of any dust motes or dust specks or any uh, sensitive or unsensitive pixels. And so you have to run flats every single night. Uh, I run flats every single night because I do have to break my setup down. If I had an observatory and could leave the camera just in place and leave everything set up every night and just park it with everything set up and you don't have to touch the imaging train at all to store it and then to use it again, then you can reuse flats. If all you need to do is just change focus slightly here or there, you can definitely reuse flats between sessions. But if you're changing the, the imaging train at all, touching the imaging train at all, other than doing small focusing movements, um, you have to take new flats. And so I am taking flats every single night. Hopefully, Sanjeev, that answered uh, your question as well. It's, it's a 6-inch F4 imaging newt, uh, just a regular, you know, cheapo Chinese-made uh, imaging Newtonian, 6-inch F4, uh, on a Celestron Alt-As mount that is on my homemade wedge and pier that stays outside permanently polar lined. Um, and then on the camera tonight I'm using is the 533, the ZWO 533. Um, uh, the, for, taking, um, for taking the flats themselves, Frank, I actually um, have a, an LED magnifier light that I clamp about eight or ten inches in front of the front of the tube and I place a, the, an opaque panel from a tracing tablet over the top of the tube and, uh, and take the flats that way. And uh, it seems to do a fairly good job. <coughs> Hi Dave, good evening. Um, my skies here how dark are they? Depending on which light pollution map you look at, I'm either a high Bortle 2 or low Bortle 3. So, pretty dark by most folks' standards. Um, I'm darker than most people's even dark sites um, here in my yard. So, um, I usually have some pretty good, pretty good stuff going on. In fact, Okay, well, Running Man. The breeze has now just died off, and so it's, uh, I could get a little bit better on Running Man here. I'm gonna actually going to start the stack over, see if I can get a little bit better on this. Because if we can keep the breeze down, this will uh, jiggle the scope a whole lot less, and this will come out a lot better. So, we've had a little bit of a breeze here in the first 15 or 20 minutes. So, um, that's kind of jiggled things around and mushed things around, and my stars turned into eggs, and <laughs> the nebula kind of uh, blurred. So, maybe dealing with a little bit of intermittent breeziness tonight, but hopefully it'll calm down. We'll be able to do some do some nice stuff. I am hoping to be able to use as much as 60 second subs tonight, uh, if possible, on some of the fainter things that we're going to look at. But uh, if it's breezy, that's not going to happen. So right now, these are 16 second subs that I'm using um, uh, in this region. Because some of the things we're going to see tonight, including the, the Running Man in this case, or the Orion Nebula, or uh, the object around Almatak, Flame, and the Horsehead, uh, those are going to take, um, th those are bright objects, mostly, and so they're going to take much less than a 60 second sub to, uh, to bring those in. But this is turning out, now that the breeze has died off and everything is kind of still, this is, uh, this is coming out much nicer. Much nicer than before for the running man. Uh, Sixteen seconds, yeah, good, all right, good, good, good. <coughs> but 
but the whole Orion area is just so. And again, the, the Running Man, for those who've joined a little bit late, the Running Man is actually the top quote-unquote star in the asterism that is, the, is Orion's sword. That's this, this whole complex of nebulae here, which is actually three nebulas according to the NGC catalog. There's actually three different NGC numbers in here um, because they consider the, 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 each of these individual nebulae divided by this dark dust lane that's going through the middle. It's all called the Running Man, and most people just call it NGC 1977 to refer to the whole thing, but it's actually technically three things. So, but it is located in the top, quote unquote, star of the Orion's uh, of Orion's sword. And there's just so much stuff in here to see, and we're going to be looking at a lot of this stuff around here tonight. Uh, John, hey, thanks for being here. Uh, is it better to use darks and flats during live stacking in SharpCap or in post-processing? Um, uh, well, John, I don't, I don't ever do any post-processing, so I'm probably the wrong person to ask. Um, I would assume, though, because darks and flats give you the cleanest images and the highest signal-to-noise ratio images, for your for your data collection that you would later post process I would assume that taking darks and flats during your data collection whether it's live stacking or or you know spending spending the night doing astrophotography collecting hours and hours of data on a target I would assume that you would want to use those things during the data collection to give you the cleanest amount of data the cleanest data sources to work from when you post process how much you can do after the fact I don't know because I don't do that. I'm a strict EAA or I am not an astrophotography person. Um, I would assume you can do quite a bit, but uh, I don't really know for sure because that's not what I do. Hopefully it answers your question. If not, go ahead and ask another one. I'll take my best shot at it. All right. Got to brighten this up a little more. I notice I am getting some noise tonight in the background a little bit. I'm getting some blue speckles, but I think most of that is being uh, <laughs> eliminated by the compression algorithms used by YouTube when you uh, <coughs> when these live streams are broadcast. My discovery has been uh <coughs> whether it's YouTube or Facebook or Zoom or whatever they use compression algorithms to make the video flow more smoothly, uh, to make just the give give better video performance, even if you have a flaky, uh, you know, a flaky internet connection. And that compression causes signal loss, um, which in this case means I have to really brighten things up for you guys to be able to see them bright enough, um, and also eliminate some of the noise just by the nature of what it's uh, what it's doing. So. Um, in some ways it helps, in some ways it hurts, but um, what I've found is that it's just, uh, I just have to be careful and kind of push things, stretch things as hard as I can to make them as bright as possible for you guys to overcome the signal loss that happens when uh, these are streamed uh, to you. So, I just so as you you see as I'm uh, <coughs> you can see as I'm going through and uh, continuing to increase the stretch that uh, uh, I seem to be experiencing some disconnection issue here for some reason. Well, hopefully I'm still live. I can't tell if I am or not. Um, I just got an hourglass here and a chat disconnected even though my broadcast software seems to indicate it's doing okay. So, not sure what's happening, but hopefully you guys are still seeing this and hearing me. <coughs> anyway, the goal is that I'm trying to uh, chat disconnected.
disconnected. Well, let's see. Let me refresh this page and see what happens. Okay, well, <laughs> I seem to be live again. I just had to refresh my page. I'm not sure what that was all about. Okay, good. Um, for some reason, the, the my monitoring computer, because I have to actually... I'm controlling my scope with one laptop, which right next to it is another laptop that I'm actually monitoring the stream. Uh, so the monitoring computer suddenly lost chat, it lost it hourglass, it lost the video, it lost everything, but it looked like my, the stream kept going, which is which is good. Um, and I do the monitoring on the second computer again because there's so much signal loss in the image that on my controlling computer I have to stretch it so aggressively and make it so bright and blown out and noisy and horrible looking on my screen to make it look good for you guys. <laughs> so I need to have the second computer so I know what you're seeing. Um, otherwise um, if I go by what's on my screen it'll be much too dark for you guys and you won't be able to see much of anything. So the only way I can get it nice and bright for you is to make it look terrible on my screen so the second computer is important to monitor that. Anyway, everything seems to be back, and as I was saying, uh, I just need to keep getting aggressive on the stretch um, and make it look really lousy on my screen to make it look good for you guys. And you can see I've, we've got a bit more extended uh, nebulosity showing up. Um, again, my stars are starting to oval a little bit because I do have a little bit of breeze blowing things around just a little bit here and there, but for the most part, I think it's coming out okay. <clears throat> so hopefully I answered your question, John. Um, let me know if uh, if I didn't. <clears throat> okay, and let's see what. Uh, so we started off with Running Man, which had Lost Jewel, Barnard's Loop, Cosmic Bat. Okay, well, let's see about the Cosmic Bat next. I don't think I've ever uh, looked at that one. But this one looks pretty good. So I'm going to try it also. I'm, I'm using... Ah, see, here is the dreaded disconnection notice. And this is what's been happening with my mount. CPWI just randomly loses connection. Sometimes I can hit yes a few times and it will reconnect and everything will be fine. But every now and again it won't reconnect and the only solution seems to be power cycle the mount and realign. So if it doesn't come back here, that may be what I have to do. Celestron, so far, even though we've reported this on the Team Celestron forums, a number of us have reported this issue, so far no one has even acknowledged our posts. So, <laughs> I don't know if this is going to be fixed. We're 90% sure it's a CPWI issue, but... Yeah. Because different people are getting a, are getting this error message, whether they're connected wirelessly or connected via USB cable to the hand controller, or it doesn't seem to really matter how you're connected or what you're doing. CPWI seems to be the only common denominator. Okay, well, it looks like this is not going to reconnect, which means I'm going to have to take a realignment intermission and realign my scope. <sighs> very, very frustrating. And this happens just randomly. Yep, okay, well, I'm just going to have to disconnect. All right, so, but before I do that, so I'll just say no there. That will disconnect. And we can now save Running Man.
So I'm going to go up and use my, now I have some scripts set up here, or some sequences, excuse me, in the new sequencer, the new SharpCap 3.3 sequencer. And um, my next, when I'm ready for the next target, I can do this. And it will save the current live stack, stop the stacking, set my exposure to one second, because I'm going to go, my exposure to one second, set my gain to 600, because now I'm going to go look for another object, and then stops. And so that's what I've, so it has now been saved. And so now, um, but now I'm going to have to um, take a mount timeout here and power cycle my mount and realign. So uh, go grab a coffee or something. I'll be back in a minute or so here. Okay, so it seems to be reconnected, so we're going to do redo the auto and law. Luckily, I have StarSense. So StarSense makes realignments a lot quicker and easier. So now it's just going to take a couple of minutes and go through its realignment process. Thankfully, again, it's automated. And... Uh, and we should be back in business. <coughs> yeah, I really love my I really love my star sense. I love it. I love it especially now that I'm having to do random realignments. <coughs> it's, uh, but I, yeah, I really love it. It saves so much time. You know, I, I don't even have a finder scope installed on my, on my scope. Um, I never have to use a finder scope to, to do any star alignments. I never have to worry about my approach direct, my go-to approach direction on the, I mean, it's just a whole bunch of hassle solved by star sense. I think it is just the coolest thing. Um, and uh, obviously it makes issues like this uh, a lot more bearable because I can just let it do the work. Well, I'm really glad to hear, Sanjeev, that you're, uh, you've never had a drop. Because uh, it seems to be happening to some of us pretty much constantly. 
So uh, I don't know. It's it's. I don't know what the common denominator is. Um, uh, it really doesn't matter. Uh, there are people who are connected via cable. There are people who are connected wirelessly. In my case, I'm I'm using the internal Wi-Fi on the Evolution itself to connect wirelessly, and. Um, <sighs> It, uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, it, it's the only commonality seems to be um, the uh, CPWI. So yes, and I've heard the install CPWI after ASCOM thing too. And my CPWI was installed way after ASCOM, and it's still causing the issues. So, okay, let me get on an alignment star here. So let me get, uh, let's just go to, well, let's go to Bellatrix. And make sure that I am on it. And get our, get everything synced synchronized here there you are you pretty little star okay let's put you in the center so I've got you centered here another thing I'm really liking about sharp cap uh, 3 3 is the fact that the mount controls you don't have to use the mouse to mount con to do the mount movements anymore in the mount control panel it's it's hotkeyed now control i j k l which is very nice not have to fish around with the mouse and uh click those um no 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 that's not what i'm trying to get at you are what i'm supposed to be trying to get at sync on you there we go. Okay. So, I think we're back in business. Hopefully that will not happen too much this evening. Okay, and so the next item, let's see, what we're going to do next? Yeah, the Cosmic Bat Nebula. This one I have never imaged, so let's see what we can see here. Cosmic Bat. It's like it's a pretty good size for my uh, for my field of view with the 533. Yeah, it looks like it's right up in here. It looks like there's something in there. One, two, three. Yeah, okay. I think it's I think it's probably probably going to be pretty close. Okay. So let me try running my script. Start imaging. Oh, but before I do that, let's put in NGC 1788. I think that's right. NGC 1788 into there. And then let's run our script to start image. Now the start imaging script loads the camera profile. Sets exposure to 60 seconds, starts the live stack, and then waits two seconds and clears out the old stuff. So, in this case, we're going to be trying 60 second exposures. The wind has died off here pretty much completely, so I'm thinking that we should be able to. Uh, do 60 second exposures without too much trouble. We will see. Last night I was out here um, doing this and uh, 60 second exposures were were coming in very nicely. Stars were nice and round and tight so if the breeze stays down we should be able to do this tonight. Good morning Ollie over there in Germany. Good to see you dropping by. Uh, it's pretty early for you. Yeah, Al, I've tried. Yeah, 
I'm also using a well I'm also using a powered hub um, but uh, it doesn't seem to make any difference so um, let's back that off a little bit right now um, I've also tried resetting things um, I've tried different I've tried different uh, different approaches to try and make this work and it just I just can't seem to make it work so it's power so actually for me unlike most people for me when I get the error message that says you've disconnected most of the time for me just hitting yes a few times reconnects most of the time it successfully reconnects so usually I don't have to do anything more than that but more and more I I don't know well we'll have to see we'll have to see what happens Okay. Uh, you are supposed to be down. Okay. <coughs> okay, so again, this is NGC 1788, the Cosmic Bat Nebula. Yeah, Sanjeev. Well, hey, I'll take any advice you want to try and post. That uh, I'll be happy, happy with that. Um, I am connected wirelessly um, directly to the um, Wi-Fi that's in the evolution, and uh, I'm not the only person doing this who's having this issue. People are with cable connections to the hand controller are experiencing this. People connecting wirelessly are experiencing this. I actually don't even have the hand controller connected. It's not even out of the box. Um, I'm just connecting wirelessly to the evolution mount directly, uh, you know, uh, wirelessly, and um, uh, the I don't even bother to use the the hand controller. I don't even have it connected. Uh, I don't really need it. So, um, you know, I've I've heard other people. Um, Noah has suggested, yeah, it's the drivers for the USB to uh, serial that are in the bottom of the hand controller when you plug in. Um, and uh, for me, that doesn't, that doesn't, uh, that's not the case because I'm not using the hand controller at all. Um, so people have tried different things. I have yet to find a sequence that solves it for me. So I'm, I would be interested to see what, uh, what you have uh, for a Wi-Fi solution. I'm certainly up for trying anything. But anyway. Here we are with 60 second uh, subs, and you can see I'm still getting a little bit of vignetting in the corners. Um, in fact, let me stretch this a little more. Time to stretch so that you guys can see a little bit more of that brightness there. And it's also time to do a color balance. It's about right, I think. Go up a couple on the blue. It's interesting. In 3.2, when you did a color balance based on histogram peaks, the blue is always too low, or too high. In 3.3, it's just the opposite. Now the blue is always a little bit too low. I'm still getting a little bit of vignetting in the corners, but it's not too bad. The flats, for the most part, are doing their job. So... Yeah, Ollie, the wedges, <laughs> well, wedges are a total pain in the neck to set up. They're unwieldy, heavy, bulky, obnoxious things that I do not recommend unless you can leave it set up permanently. Um, as I was showing folks earlier, and you probably weren't here for that, this is my setup. Um, just a simple concrete block pier that's glued together with construction adhesive, the blocks are, although they are not glued to the pad because I sometimes I may have to move it. Um, but it and the wedge stay outside permanently polar aligned. The mount and the scope and everything else goes inside at night. But the wedge and pier are permanently polar aligned and 
That is the only way I would recommend using a wedge, honestly. If you can leave the sucker outside, and I just put a trash bag over the top of this if I ever get any rain, uh, but if you can leave it outside permanently polar aligned, then it's basically no more work than setting up an alt-as scope, but you get all the benefits of the equatorial mounted, the, the wedge uh, being equatorially mounted. Um, so that, to me, is the way to use a wedge. Setting up a wedge every single night especially under a CPC, which is a much bigger, heavier operation than my evolution. Um, it's, let's put it this way, it's more work than I'm willing to do. And so, uh, you know, I highly recommend if you're going to use a wedge, either be patient and prepared to uh, do a lot more work than I am when you set up, or uh, find some way to permanently leave it outside if you can. You know, leave it permanently polar aligned if you can possibly do that. And, uh, I mean, I, I love it. I love what I'm doing because I have all the advantages of using the wedge, but none of the work associated with setting it up each night. I just put the evolution on the wedge and put the scope in the Evo and do a star sense star align and I'm going. And I can pull in 60 second subs like this. <coughs> And, uh, you know, for the most part, even at 60, this is the first time I've really tried to do 60 seconds. Uh, last night I did a little bit. And you can see I do have a slight ovaling on some of the stars. Some of the stars are a little bit ovaled. I didn't really get much ovaling last night. Tonight I seem to be getting more of it. <coughs> but, uh, uh, let me stretch this a little bit more. A little bit more aggressively, but it's not—it's not too bad for 60 seconds. I mean, don't get me wrong, Ollie. Wedges are I mean, being equatorially mounted is great. You know, I mean, you can't hope to do 60-second subs or even 30-second subs if you are simply alt as mounted. Um, you just can't hope to do it. So it's 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 very cool to be able to use an equatorial mount, whether a GEM or a wedge. But setting up a wedge every night, yuck. I won't do it. Okay. Cosmic Bat Nebula. Seventeen eighty-eight. Oop, and we got a satellite zooming through the upper right-hand corner. <laughs> when this next sub comes in, it'll complete its path, zooming right across there. That's pretty cool. <coughs> um, Frank, do I find that my focus changes throughout the sessions when the OTA cools? Um, not, well, not that much. Um, I very rarely have to do, uh, even in a two-hour long session, I find that I very rarely have to do a focus readjustment. Um, now, one of the things I do is I set the scope outside in the shade a couple of hours before I start any session. So the scope is pretty well acclimated long before I even put it in the mount. Um, so temperature changes um, over the course of the night it does cool off but I'm not finding that it uh, that it really is that it really causes much of an issue um, I have not found that even if you know a couple of hours later I put the mask on the Batnov mask on and check the focus and it's usually pretty much right on so I have not really had to uh, I've not really found it to be a problem with this little newt um, another thing I have not found to be a problem with a newt, uh, which you'll hear a lot of refractor guys say is, oh, those fast imaging Newtonians and those astrographs, you got to collimate them all the time. You, you know, they go out of collimation. I have owned this thing for about six months. I've done easily 30 sessions on it, and I've only had to recollimate once. Uh, I find that they hold collimation very well, as long as you're obviously not bumping it and banging it around. I mean, I treat it gently and gingerly, but 
I don't find that uh, collimation is an issue either. Uh, I do not have a focus motor installed, um, and I don't use uh, sharp caps focusing, uh, uh, any of their focusing tools. I just put a Batnov mask on, zoom in on the star that I'm looking at in the camera in, in sharp cap. So I use the sharp cap view to see what I'm to see the star that I have the the, the star pad the the, tr the hex pattern on with the Batnov mask, but I don't use any of the sharp cap focusing tools. No. <coughs> um, Dave, uh, hi Dave. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, if you continue to stack, will the satellite trails wash out the noise? Uh, in my case, no. There are actually two kinds of stacking. Uh, methodologies in um, SharpCap. Number one is the default, and the default is um, basically all frames are just added to one another. Nothing is subtracted, everything is just added, 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 <coughs> and it's, 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 it's stacking by adding all the frames together. The sigma clipping, that is actually frame averaging. So that is that will average all of the frames together, and that is the the type of stacking that will take something that's just in a couple of frames, like our nice little satellite trail here, and it will eventually average it out and make it go away if you stack on it for a little while. Um, so I am not using the sigma clipping. I'm not using the averaging. Um, I'm actually doing the uh, the frame adding. So uh, I just found I get better results with that, and so that's what I've been using. But you can um, you can use uh, the other form if you do want. If you get a lot of satellite trails, a lot of airplane, you know, if you're if you're in a, a if you're under a um, an air traffic corridor, you can switch to the frame averaging, um, the sigma clipping, and uh, and that will help get rid of some of those trails. <coughs> Frank, you said you messed up your EVO's collimation. What do you mean your EVO's collimation? Uh, so an evolution is a mount, not a scope. Do you have like a, an SCT on your evolution? Like, a, you know, an, uh, an EVO 8 or an 8HD H, H, or that kind of thing. I'm assuming that's what you mean. You got Bob's knobs for your scope. And, uh, <clears throat> anyway, you can clarify that, but that's probably what you mean. Yeah, it's an Evo 8 SCT. Yeah, okay, that's that's what I figured. Yeah, um, yeah, most people swear by Bob's knobs, so I don't know. I've never used them. I've never had a scope that I needed them on. I, I'm a Newtonian guy. I don't like refractors. SCTs are really nice. Um, uh, they are... Uh, they're they're jack of all trades. They're really great, but I'm as an imager, I like imaging newts. They're just simple and effective and do the job. In any event, we've been on our little uh, cosmic bat nebula here for about 14 minutes, so that's more than enough. So now I am going to go into my sequencer and do the next target. So again, that'll save my current target, save my live stack, stop the stacking, set my exposure to one gain to 600 so that I am now ready to move on to the next object. And I also want I also want as they don't have the ability to I also want to have the zoom restored to 20%. I want to be able to restore a zoom level and they don't I've requested that that be added. That's not a functionality that's currently in the beta, but I've uh, requested that that be added. So which head Now which head is a big big deal. I don't know if there's a whole lot of point in me doing which head. It's so, it, it's way bigger than my, than my FOV. So, um, I don't know that it's really worth me trying to do this. Maybe I'll just focus on this star. I'll just go to this star. And, uh, oop. Oh, look what happened again. Look what happened again. Okay, but this time it reconnected. Okay. 
This time it worked. Okay, so now we could be able to do this. Put the scope on there. See, most of the time that's what happens. When I get the disconnect notice, most of the time when I say yes, it works. So I don't complain too much, but now and again I do get the opportunity to... Uh, Boy, this is a faint one, isn't it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's see what we got here. Uh, uh, uh. Hmm. Well, I'm going to assume I'm pretty close. I suspect I'm pretty close. So let's just assume that I am. Oh, and I need to... Uh, yeah, let's try... Let's put which head? Uh, which... Head. Always a challenge to try and type in gloves. All right. Type it in and start imaging. Again, which loads, reloads my profile, sets the exposure to 60 seconds, starts live stacking. For some reason, when the live stacking starts, it puts a garbage frame in. It puts a garbage sub in almost immediately that screws everything else up because there's no stars in the garbage sub, so it can't align. So, it, so anyway. I have to wait for two seconds and do a reset live stack, and that clears it out. Um, because for some reason, when I just do start a live stack, it puts a garbage frame in there. I'm not sure what that's about, but um, anyway. <coughs> Let's see. Let's see if we're close here. Ollie asks what gain I am using. I am currently using a gain of 300. Um, that seems to be about right. Since I've gone to 60 second exposures, I could probably even turn that down if I wanted to. Um, yeah, we got a little something something in here. Uh, I could probably turn that down if I wanted to, um, but I'm finding 300 gain is, uh, is uh, working out pretty well. For me, so let's make it a little less noisy at first. All right, so this is basically just going to be kind of the top of the top of the witch's hat. <laughs> is uh, is what we're, I'm assuming that's the top of the witch's hat. I'm assuming that's her hat up there, and then that's her and her broom. I don't know. But I'm gonna I'm just gonna do this top portion of it because it's obviously way too big for my FOV. Um, and my FOV with the, with the 533 on this scope, and I'm just about 600 millimeters of focal length, is just a hair over one degree by one degree, because the 533 is a square sensor. So, um, <coughs> it's uh, but yeah, but the Obviously, the witch head is a good three degrees across, maybe even more. Yeah, it is pretty faint. What, are the, what does it say for... Well, actually, I took the thing off it, didn't I? And which head? Surface brightness of almost mag-18. Wow. That's probably just an average surface brightness, because some of this is pretty faint. I'm doing kind of the brightest area, so I'm, I'm kind of cheating. Um, but... Uh, I love it when Stellarium picks the scope as the object. No, no. Ew. Um, I'm kind of cheating by doing the most bright, the brightest part of it. Um, so, yeah, it is showing up for me, and, and, and that which is not to, uh, which is not to discredit the 533. The 533 is a pretty darn awesome camera. So, um, it's uh, super sensitive, and uh, no. Amp glow. Um, it is a bit of a noisy camera, so you always do want to use darks. Uh, darks with it. Um, lights are also a really good idea. Um, 
uh, lights. <laughs> yeah, lights are also a good idea because that's actually the the frame, the image frames. But uh, flats are also uh, pretty good and pretty important as well. Um, but uh, <coughs> uh, but it is a it is a it is a great camera. I really do love it. In fact, I can I can stretch much more aggressively with the 533 than I could with uh, with other cameras. And uh, what I when I actually found when I when I tested last night was the first night I actually tried using 60 second uh, sub exposures, and what I found is that I expected the objects I expected everything to be brighter, um, but what I'm actually finding is the objects aren't necessarily brighter, but it does a much better job. The longer integration time, the longer exposures, actually do a really great job darkening the background better. So I'm getting better contrast in my images, um, even though the objects are not really brighter. Um, the sky background. Every time a sub completes, you'll see the sky background darken and darken and darken. Um, and so the longer exposures are actually giving me much better contrast. Now maybe the objects aren't getting are the same because my histogram adjustments are making them about the same and everything else is dropping off and you know, so I you know the signal to noise ratio the contrast seems to be higher the signal to noise ratio seems to be higher so the longer exposures are definitely having their impact um, uh, they're just, just not quite in the way I expected but maybe it's my own histogram adjustments that are uh, that are causing the objects to not be brighter but everything else to be darker but the end result is the, uh, the 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 images are definitely coming through better with uh, with the 60 second as opposed to the 32 second that I've been doing up to this point. So, um, <coughs> yeah, Ollie, you're right. No chance without the wedge to do uh, to have long enough exposures to do this. Yeah, even with the 533, I don't think it would pick uh, this up in much less than 20 seconds, maybe even 30. So, which which is for for a lot of people say they could do they can yeah I could get close to 20 seconds uh, just using the Evo by itself with no wedge. Um, so I found 16 seconds to be totally workable, and would keep my stars around. If I went much more than that, they started to oval. Or the field rotation started to streak stuff at the outer corners, um, but some people say they can get as much as 30 seconds. So I don't know. It depends how how hard you want to push your alt as mount, your your CPC to uh, to get this. But uh, I would think it would take at least 20 seconds of exposure to be able to get something this faint <coughs> to get you the get you the signal to noise ratio that you need. Oh, and look who's coming right through the image. Another satellite coming right on through. Yay. <laughs> oh, 24 seconds. Wow. Okay, Ollie, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I, like I said, for me, anything much beyond 16 on my Evo it uh it it made the stars unacceptable. I was just getting streaks or ovals for stars, and things were smudging, so I just really couldn't do it. But on the wedge, even at sixty seconds i mean i I don't know where my limit is with this wedge right now. Um, I used the sharp cat polar alignment tool and got it to within half an arc minute thirty arc seconds of uh of right on and so for you know 30 and 60 second subs that's more than enough but uh, I haven't tested yet to see exactly how far I can push it so we'll see I mean even sometimes I do get slightly oval stars uh, I do get slightly oval stars even with uh, even at 60 yeah see they're ever so slightly oval but not enough to complain about so We have a nice <coughs> s 
satel satellite interloper going right through here. <coughs> We can't <laughs> gonna go right through the image. Well, we're gonna get a great high-resolution satellite trail through our witch head, through our witch hat. <clears throat> I think another thing I want to do is uh, is set up a. What, uh, I want to do a sequence to set up a dither, a manual dither, where you pause the live stack and then you move the scope just, you know, 50 pixels or something. And then you, uh, you keep, uh, then you resume the stack again. <coughs> Some people, Corey, Corey Mooney uh, likes doing that. He does manual dithers on his, uh, when he does live streams, when he's doing his EAA, uh, because he has, with his 294, he has hot pixels that show up, um, and it helps get rid of the hot pixels. Again, they get averaged out. But I think, okay, okay yeah, but I, I think in that case, I would have to use the averaged stacking to do that, because then otherwise, if it's just additive stacking, the manual dither wouldn't work. So never mind, I'd have to go to a different type of stacking to do it. Which wouldn't be a showstopper, but let's see. Just tweak this up. Use the shift key here and tweak it up just a little bit. Stretch it just a little bit harder. <coughs> But that's ten minutes or so. That's that's about good. I I don't usually spend more than about ten minutes on stuff. But uh, I think that's probably going to be probably going to be good. Yeah. Okay. Well, there we go. That's pretty good. Which head? Come out pretty nice. This is the kind of thing that you can uh, take a little extra time on. The more time you take, the better it comes out. You could even do a little full screen action. Get rid of, get rid of the sharp cap. <laughs> Our satellite severed witch's hat. There is some nice there are some nice little dark lanes in there though. Some nice detail here and there. <coughs> and of course it's in a rich star field because it's <coughs> it's right near Orion, which is in the uh one of the arms of the Milky Way. So we got a big rich star field. Okay. Let's see what our next thing is going to be. Next target. Save that off. Stop the stack, set exposure, and we're done. Okay. Who's next? Lost Jewel of Orion. Okay, yeah, so this is going to be... Well, as you, we might as well just do... Let's just do... Well, hmm. If I do 40... If I try and do 42, M42, which is the big, bright Orion Nebula, if I try and do that at the same time as this... I'll never be able to get this because it will just completely blow. If I set the exposure up high enough to get this, bring this 
much dimmer thing in, it'll blow that out. So I think what I'm going to do is <coughs> I'm going to try and move M42 out of my frame. And there you can see it up here, just the bottom part of it up here. I'm going to try and move that out of my frame. So again, I'm going to go Control K and try and move that sucker out of my frame. Why is it not responding? <laughs> hmm. Well, the mount movement is not responding. Don't know why. See what happens if I do this. Yeah, that, okay, so I go into the UI and it works. Hmm. Sometimes I have to use the UI. To, then now the hotkeys work again. So sometimes I have to jog it with the UI to get the hotkeys to work. Okay. Well, anyway, let's see what we can see. So we're, we should be pretty much right on it now. So let's, um, this is going to be the Lost Jewel. NGC 1980. NGC 1980. Yes, okay, very good. And now sequencer and start imaging. Now again, this is a really bright area. And so, <coughs> we will have to see, 60 seconds may just be way too much here. We may get so much light wash. <clears throat> that it may just totally blow it out. But we'll find out. Um... Yeah, Frank, photobomb. I was trying to think of that word. All I could think of was flash mob. I couldn't. I couldn't think of photobomb. That's exactly what it was—the satellite photobomb, the witch, the witch's hat. Totally, what happened? Um, could you crop to a smaller resolution? Yeah, Frank, you can. Um, you can do something in SharpCap, which is called an ROI, uh, and then the capture format area. You can actually. Uh, yeah, you can specify a smaller capture area. Um, so you can specify a smaller capture area, which will put a square, a movable square on your screen, so you can actually only pay attention to that area, and SharpCap will ignore the rest, um, nor ignore everything else. Um, so uh, you can actually crop your camera to use something smaller. Now, as expected here, we're getting a lot of the whole bottom of M42 is still in there and it's <coughs> creating a whole big thing. Um, so I'm hmm Well, it's so it's almost inseparable from M42. You know what? Let's try. Let's let's stop this. Let's stop this. We'll save it as is, whatever, that's fine. I'll throw it away later. Let me see if I can't just get it up even further. Come on. Again, the hotkeys are not working. Hmm. Not sure why that is. Okay, I need to close you, I need to open you, and I need you to go up. Try and get you up as high as I can get you. So we're in the top of the very top of the sensor. Alright, let's try that. Start imaging. 
Let's try that one and see if we don't get we get all that garbage at the top. Well, garbage M42s. That's that's beautiful garbage, but let's see if we can get all that light out of the top so that our 60 second exposure can hopefully pick some more of that up. Some of the faint, much fainter nebulosity around the lost jewel. We'll see what we can figure out. <clears throat> uh, Sanjeev asked, do you use plate solving for centering? Uh, yes, I can. Um, I have uh, ASTAP uh, uh, installed, and I do use that for plate solving when necessary. Um, I, it's pretty rare that I use it. Uh, number one, because my star sense alignment um, uh, it seems to be pretty accurate, and it gets things in my field of view. 98% uh, of the time, certainly within the field of view, about 95 plus percent of the time, uh, with with the 533, which again is a one degree field of view. Um, so I don't typically use it, but even if I can't see the thing right off at first, I actually still like trying to find it manually. Somehow, to me, looking for something that I'm not sure is it there and, and looking and finding it kind of harkens back to my old visual astronomy days. To me that feels more like astronomy than just clicking a button and letting a machine find the thing for you. So, you know, that, that seems to take some of the, the fun out of it, some of the astronomy out of the equation for me. So, I, uh, I like trying to find it on my own um, anyway, even if I don't see it right away. So, generally, the only time I use plate solving is if I can't see it and I can't find it, you know, even increasing the exposure a little bit and stretching the histogram, uh, the display histogram, if I can't find it, um, then I will use a plate solve, and I use uh, I use ASTAP, which is very very fast. <clears throat> um, okay, so Frank and Ollie, I think, are asking the same question uh, in terms of screwing up flats and darks. Um, I don't. Let's see. Does changing ROI screw up the dark? I don't know if it screws up the dark or not. It could. I know it screws up the flat. So yes, I think you have to decide uh, your 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 image size, your resolution, your binning, your format, uh, all this you know, all the stuff that's up here in the the capture format and area. You have to. I think you can't change any of this. If you change any of these things, you have to redo your flats. Um, so I think you have to make sure your binning or your capture area or your color space or any of that stuff, all that has to be set um, before you can actually um, do your flats. And if you change any of those, you have to redo your flats. So yeah, doing an ROI um, definitely does require um, that your flats need to be redone. And I got a computer that needs to be plugged in, so we'll plug you in. <coughs> <clears throat> yeah, and I'm I'm not sure about the darks, but it would also make sense for the darks too. Um that you couldn't uh that you would have to uh, do different darks as well. <clears throat> well, what are we thinking? The lost jewel is definitely there. I don't know how well we're getting it still. There's still <laughs> 42 is still so bright that uh you know maybe what I want to try and do I can try saving this. We've got about 4 minutes here. I could try saving this and maybe what I'll try and do is I'll I'll do the same thing again but we'll drop to a 32 second exposure. And uh we'll see we'll see if we get any something any better. <clears throat> but we'll do, you know, five or six minutes on this, and then see if we can't, uh, and then we'll see if we can't drop the exposure to 32 seconds, which is my next exposure duration that I have darks for, and, uh, and see if that doesn't pick it up a little bit better. <clears throat> 
the stars are certainly very bright. Of course, this whole region, like like I said, the, the whole Orion region is just a huge star-forming complex. All these bright blue-white stars are just everywhere in here because they're all just really, they're babies. They're newborns that are just leaving the nest and starting to move out into the universe. <clears throat> All right, time for a drink of water. I think I'll mute this so you don't have to listen to me slurp on water. <laughs> That's better. All right, we'll do that. So there's there's six minutes. The background is cleaning up nicely, but the stars in M42 I think are too blown out. <coughs> so I think what we're going to do is we're going to save that. We'll try that exactly as seen, and then let's drop to. 32 seconds. Hmm. I'm going to need to be 32. Uh, 32 seconds. And then I will need to pull in my other dark. My 32 second dark, which should be right there. That's positive 10. Uh, 32 seconds. 10. 32. Uh, where is it? Okay. When in doubt, just go here. Negative 10. That's what my thing is set for. Okay, 30 seconds. Oh, and here goes the mount. <coughs> here goes the mount. Okay, well, let's... let's Go away. Go... Uh, let's... Uh, okay, now CPWI is not even letting me do anything. Clear this. Okay. Ugh, this disconnect issue is just truly frustrating. But it looks like it took again. <coughs> All right. Now, of course, this looks terrible because the histogram is still set up for the 60 second exposures. Uh, let's get this fixed. See if we can't uh no. let's see what thirty two seconds does if it makes any improvements. <coughs> Everything is definitely dimmer. Let's see what, uh, let's see what Gary posted for a picture. I wonder if he posted a picture for this one. <coughs> when he put up the, uh, the challenge, see if he actually has a picture with it. Yeah, it's going to find and take a minute to... I haven't checked on you in a while. Come on. You're getting there. Good, Sanjeev. I, I look forward to whatever you're going to put up. <coughs> Like I said, I, I would love this to be fixed. I mean, I love using CPWI. Um, I like it so much better than the hand controller. But this disconnect issue, which 
doesn't uh, well, you know I, I would love to have that disist connect issue go away so you know I'll try I'll try I'll try whatever makes sense okay live broadcast challenge 2021 uh, yeah, did it at Running Man. Oh, yeah, Trapezium, Horse Head. Okay, so this is what he put. Yeah, okay. So he's basically, he's just, it's, it's just, just, it's just a cluster. So I'm not sure there's a whole lot more we're going to see anyway than what's, uh, what I've already got on here. But I could zoom in. <laughs> Look at those diffraction spikes. <laughs> Yay! Diffraction spikes. Oh well, they're pretty, right? Even if they are gigantic. Let's, make, let's do a color balance on this. That's about right. <coughs> well, there's actually two stars in here because there's two diffraction spikes out here. There's two sets of diffraction spikes in this. One, two. Huh. I wonder if it's a double star in there. So let's see. Let's compare this to the other one. Captures tonight. Uh, what are we on? This is 1980. This is 1980. So this is going to be what we got in 10 minutes. This is what we got with the one minute exposures, sub exposures. And this is what we're getting with the 30 second, 32 second. Mm. A little bit brighter and more contrast. Again, just a little bit more contrasty, I think, in the. Uh, <coughs> and this one, what? This was six minutes, yeah. So this next sub will be about equivalent. It's a pretty cluster. Oh, thanks, Frank. Good. It is a double. Okay. Oh, look. Mount has stopped responding. Yeah. Make it go away. Yeah. So there's there's about six minutes there. They're pretty close. I think the uh, the one minute exposures are a little bit more contrasty. I think the the nebulosity here is a little bit brighter. <coughs> but that could just be a histogram adjustment too. Maybe just pop the histogram a little bit brighter. <coughs> They're pretty close. Yeah, again, I think I'm getting more contrast. It's darker out here. I think I'm getting more contrast in the fainter nebula areas. The background, the nebula, I think I'm getting a little bit more contrast. That, that's what it just seemed to me in comparing 30 second to 60 second subs. I'm not seeing a huge difference in the objects, but it's, they seem to be just less noisy. <coughs> But I guess, you know, that's one of the reasons that you do longer subs, is to overcome the noise of the camera, the read noise and et cetera of the camera. Um, and so if you can do longer, 
longer longer exposures um, if you have the dark skies to do it um, they work out better <clears throat> uh, if you've if you've watched Robin Glover's video where he goes on uh, about um, uh, sub exposure length and EAA and is it really do you really need to get longer do you really need to use long sub exposures versus short which is better is it really better to use long and he kind of busts the myth that it is better um, he, uh, he indicates that short subs actually can do you better especially if you're in a light polluted area where you are longer subs are just amplifying the brightness of your background um, and so short so he really is a proponent of shorter subs most people are using too long subs he thinks um, <clears throat> the one bad news for somebody like me is if you're in a dark sky place you actually want to be using longer subs you want to be using longer exposures because your background is so dark that you can then use those longer subs to overcome the noise of the camera without amplifying the bright background light pollution because you don't have any so in those cases actually dark sky you really do want to be using longer exposures <coughs> but so I, I've been liking doing the 60 second um, exposures they've been doing pretty well for me but I think we're doing pretty good on this so I think I think we've got uh, that cluster is that cluster is pretty good so we're gonna save that and move on to our next thing here so let's find our no not that where's our stellarium got it buried deep okay Barnard's loop that seems to me this is a pretty faint one Barnard's loop now there's not even an image in stellarium as to what the heck this is so, see, I want to have the script to be able to reset my zoom, too. <laughs> Hopefully, he'll be able to do that. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we got some... Yeah, so I think some of that is this stuff here. Well, let's try stretching the display histogram. Hmm... Well, I'm going to assume we're in the neighborhood. So let's just... Okay, what do we got here? Barnard's Loop. Bar... Yuck. Typing with gloves. Barnard's... Loop. Okay, sequencer. Start imaging. Okay, so this will put us back to 60 seconds and all that jazz and we'll see what Barnard's loop will get us make sure that this yep that works the way I basically reset everything is to um, the first step is to reload the profile so I the capture profile I have set up it just reloads the capture profile which resets the display histogram resets the um, gain to 300, re basically resets the camera. No matter how I mess it up to try and find stuff, the first step of the sequence is to reload the capture profile for this camera, which resets everything. Um, and then sets my exposure to 60 seconds. So, kind of a, kind of a cool thing. Uh, Gary, Gary Hawkins actually taught me that one the other night. And, uh, uh last night he had, uh, or the night before when he did his demo of the sequencing in SharpCap 3.3. Um, one of the things he found was that reloading the um, the capture profile um, reset the display histogram, which is pretty cool because right now the controls to be able to do that in the sequence steps uh, aren't there. Uh, they're not they're, there's a bug with them so basically the only way you can really do this is to uh, uh, the, the shortcut the workaround is to reload the camera's capture profile 
Barnard's Loop, Barnard's Ark. Hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> well, this is... Yeah, so this... This cluster here, this is definitely it. Let's see if Gary put up an image of the loop. Uh, no. Oh, okay, so he what he's saying is Barnard's loop is a huge. Okay, it is huge. Okay, so I think that's what you guys are talking about in your comments here, that it's too big for my FOV. So it may just be. Well, we'll take a few minutes on this and <laughs> see if we get anything worth keeping. But <clears throat> because I, I mean, Stellarium doesn't even have any sort of image on it, so I'm not. I don't even know. I'm not even sure what it is we're supposed to be looking at. <clears throat> now, Ollie posted an image here in the text. Um. But. Uh, <clears throat> But I can't click it, so I'd have to. Uh, anyway, I don't. I don't think it matters. Um, I think it's just too big a region anyway for me to to deal with. Let's see what Wikipedia says about it. Uh, barn on its loop. Barnard's Loop is an emission nebula in Orion. It's part of the Orion Molecular Cloud Complex, which contains Horsehead and the Orion Nebula itself. The loop takes the form of a large arc centered approximately on the or centered approximately on the Orion Nebula. The stars within the Orion Nebula are believed to be responsible for the ionizing loop. Okay. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. This thing is huge. All right. <clears throat> yeah. I'm not even going to bother wasting any more time on this. It's way, way too big for any camera to see. So I'm not even sure. Diffuse red semicircle that is way bigger than M42. It's bigger than the whole sword. That's very, very big. It's about a hundred to one to three hundred light years across. It's about fifteen hundred light years away. Wait, recent place a distance of either five hundred. Recent estimates place it at a distance of either five hundred light years or fourteen hundred light years, giving it dimensions of either one hundred or three hundred light, light years across. <laughs> Thought to have originated in a supernova explosion about two million years ago. The loop extends over 600 arc minutes, covering much of Orion. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Well, we got some pretty stars here, but I think that's all we're going to see. So I think we're, I'm just going to move on. I don't think I'm going to worry about that one. So why don't we go to something like... Okay, why don't we go to something pretty cool here. Um, let's go to Alnatak next. Because Flame and Horsehead are... <coughs> both items, uh, objects, on the list. So... Um, let's see 
and I can get and with my field of view I can actually get both of them in in here so I want to move you up further so let's see if the hotkey will work this time yep okay the hotkeys are working this time good yeah, there we go alright I think that's gonna do just about right now the question is what do I want to do for I have a feeling 60 seconds is gonna be way too much for this but oh all the attack region I have a feeling that um, 60 seconds is going to be way too much but let's give it a shot horsehead is very faint um, so horsehead I know would respond really well but <clears throat> all the attack may be so bright oh see you Sanji thanks for stopping by um, and I'll see you on the forums. <laughs> and Ollie requests M78. Okay. Well, we'll see what we see when we get through with all these. We'll do M78 when we get through with all this stuff here. And, uh, hopefully we can knock out Flame and Horsehead in one go here. I did this the other night and it turned out pretty well, but I was doing it at 32 seconds not at 60. So we'll have to see what 60 seconds does. All attack may just be so blown out that it may be like looking at the sun and trying to see a nebula next to the sun. <coughs> well, not too bad. It is pretty bright, but I think I think this, this might work. And we'll let it, let it get a few subs. The color balances out, but we'll let it get a few subs. And oh yeah, let's just pull the pull the color balance in a little bit. <coughs> yeah, that's a little better. Yeah, this might work. Get flame and the horsey all in one go here. Now, obviously, the fainter part of these are, once again, um, something that could stand to spend some time on. But the more time we spend, the brighter all the attack gets and more blown out, so <laughs> kind of limited. If we wanted to do just really horse head by itself, we'd just move the move all the attack out of the view entirely and just do horse head. But I think this is this is going to come in pretty well. A <coughs> hundred eight second subs, huh? So, huh, Ollie? <laughs> yeah. Well, there. I do live out in the middle of the desert, which has its own challenges but this is why I'm here <laughs> this right here is why I am here let's get the software out of the way get the software out of the way and just enjoy it for a minute or two <coughs> Okay, yep, my black, so histogram is out just a little bit. <coughs> oh, you're right next to an international airport. Wow, yeah. I mean, my parents 
live near a regional airport, a much smaller airport. They live about two air miles away uh, from a regional airport and the skies are just trashed at their house. So I can imagine how for you that would be uh, pretty lousy. <clears throat> As we get more and more subs in and it gets cleaner and cleaner, I can push the stretch a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. It brings out more of that nebulosity. But this is uh this is a nice view. This is the five thirty three is just just does a great job with this. It does a great job managing the brightness of all in the tack and yet still picking up the faint nebulosity of flame and even horse head. CPWI's hanging on. Mounts are not disconnecting, so <clears throat> only once have we had to do a realignment, so that's good. Now, Ali, I wouldn't think that long exposures would. Um, you know, you can watch Robin's video, um, um, uh, his talk on it, but basically, you know, one of his many points is that if you are in a light polluted area, you definitely want to have go going longer exposure to overcome the read noise in the camera is defeated by the fact that once you get start getting longer and longer exposures, you're just amplifying your own light pollution, you know, the, the, the brightness of your the background sky. So longer exposures are only better for those living in light polluted areas up to a certain point. And generally speaking, um, you know, his point is that you you're better off staying with shorter integrations, shorter subs, um, and the same integration time but shorter subs to keep the background noise down a bit. <coughs> yeah, Frank, if you're in a light polluted area, light pollution filters really do help. Um, there are some that are, you know, some are better than others. Um, right now, uh, the ones that seem to be all the rage are the Optolong uh, L Enhance and L Extreme filters. Um, I see those talked about a lot. I've never bought a light pollution filter, obviously. Where I live, I it would be a total waste of money. Um, but I, um, um, they, they, they seem to be all the rage. And, and Jim Thompson, actually, on the Cloudy Nights forums, has done, I believe he's done thorough analyses of both of them. Uh, in their comparisons. He's done some reviews and comparisons of the different ones. Um, and uh, so I, I think he's done some articles on it. So you may want to look that up on the Cloudy Nights forum. <coughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, I know what the L Extreme uh, Heighten in San Diego, Astro Jedi, on the uh, Cloudy Nights forum. Uh, he does some stunning EAA with the L-Extreme. Now, he's down in San Diego, where he's probably at least in Bortle 7 or 8 skies. Um, so, maybe he needs that. But, um, 
I know they 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 everybody's raving about them, and I know they're. I, I watch their prices in the used Cloudy Nights market just keep going up and up and up. I mean, brand new L Extreme or well, L Extremes, two inch L Extremes right now on the used market are three hundred dollars. It's like wow, they used to go for a lot cheaper than that, but they seem to be pretty good. But like I said, I'm the wrong person to ask because I uh, I don't use them. <coughs> Well, there we go. There's 10 minutes. That's pretty good. I think that's pretty good for a 10-minute image. Probably even push that stretch a tiny bit more, but it's uh I think that's pretty good. <coughs> I think that came out pretty good. And we got two things out of the way at once. And the only other things that he recommended getting were, of course, M42 itself, and we'll do that next. And then trapezium in the center, which is basically the same shot, but much lower exposure, so you can actually see the core stars. So, why don't we go to that? Next target. <coughs> down here. N42 Becklin Star. <laughs> of course clicking on it. <laughs> M42. Go. <coughs> Big bright sucker. Okay, so now I, I know from this is um, I like putting it up pretty high because the nebulosity stretches so far down on it. There we go. Let's try that. Now I know. 32 seconds is way too much for this sucker. So I'm going to restart this. <coughs> but just to reset everything, but 60 seconds is going to be way too much. So I'm going to drop this down to um, uh, let's do 16. Let's do 16 seconds and let me load my dark for that. 16 seconds, negative 10. And then we will start our stack over again. <coughs> and of course, the blacks are extremely clipped because. The histogram is set up for the 60 second exposure, so let's try doing that. And that will look a whole lot better, probably. <laughs> I even didn't, I didn't even quite get it. Oh, actually, no, I did. I was thinking I didn't get quite high enough, but I'm not zoomed out. Yeah! So here is the challenge. Doing big bright objects like this, like doing the Andromeda Galaxy, your challenge is <coughs> with objects like this, is there are really bright parts and really faint parts. So if you set your exposure or your gain to get the really faint parts, the bright parts are completely blown out. If you then try and get the dim parts, you can't see any of the faint parts. So 
it is a great challenge to try and get a balance on this. Looks to me like even, well, hmm. it's a tough one. It's just a really tough one, but I think 16 is also too much. Let's try 8. Let's try eight. Um, mount stopped responding. Clear. Start again. And again, our blacks are going to be really clipped because we keep backing off on the time. <coughs> Yeah, I think I think this will be a little bit better to get at least some of the detail on the inner nebulosity. But we'll probably spend a little bit of time on this just since one of the goals here is to get the trapezium, which is the the cluster of stars right at the core of this. We're going to end up having to drop the exposure way back anyway, so we'll just try things at different exposure levels and see what happens. Wow, now that's really interesting. Why am I getting all this noise around the side, the edges here? Let's restart this. That's really weird. I've never seen that before. Okay, that's normal. Oh, I never, re I never really, uh, and 42. <coughs> okay, and Frank asks, is there any reason you chose negative 10 degrees over any other target temperature? No, not really. Um, basically, I've chosen negative 10 for the winter and positive 10 for the summer, uh, just because I know that those are things my camera can uh, the cooling on the ZWO cameras can do can do a drop of about 30 or 35 degrees C maximum. So um, I'm just trying to set a temperature that you know I know that regardless of what winter temperature it is, I know my camera can achieve it without sucking down huge amounts of energy. Honestly, for when doing EAA, let me get that out of the way. For doing EAA. Um, you don't really cooling isn't really all that necessary anyway. I mean, even at 60 seconds, maybe at 60 seconds it might start having an impact, but um, most people think that for doing 30 seconds or less, you don't really need cooling anyway. It doesn't really have any impact, so it's not really a big deal. I'm not sure even at 60 seconds that's going to be a big deal, um, but uh, <coughs> okay. Why is this happening? I'm getting reverse vignetting. The outsides of the image are brightening with every sub. Let me look at the individual frames. They're completely dark. And yet as they stack, I'm getting a whole bunch of noise. Uh... Display histogram has been reset. Eight second, three hundred. What am I doing wrong? That's the flat from tonight. That's an eight second. A negative ten. It's the right dark. It's the right flats. Why is this happening? No, I've got the right no, the dark is in there and it's correct. 
I have never had this happen before. This is really weird. Um. Huh. And the histogram adjustments don't seem to do any adjustment. Yeah, the histogram adjustment, the histogram doesn't adjust. It only adjusts the object, it doesn't adjust... Wow. Um... I wonder if this is some sort of 3.3 three beta bug. I don't... I mean, would have seen something before now, though. Why would that be just happening now as opposed to earlier? Huh. I have no idea why this is happening. some sort of noise being added by the stacking process because let me turn the enhancements off no that doesn't do much and those are set correctly Wow, this is really weird. I have no idea what's uh what's causing this. I wonder if there's something wrong with my dark. Let's try going to the other dark, which shouldn't. Ah, and now you are going to start again. Come on, reconnect. Come on, reconnect. This is truly an aggravating bug. Just randomly and intermittently loses connection. And it looks like I'm going to have to realign again. I have absolutely no idea why this is occurring. This is really, really weird. 
I have never seen this before. So, um... We're getting these spikes in the histogram. From what? I have no clue. All right, let's reload the profile and reset you. So even at one second, so I have a bunch of noise being added. And it's the stacking process that's adding the noise. So even at one second, I'm getting all this noise. that's being added by the stacking process. Oh, well. The FWHM is... Huh. Well, that may be the evening here. I have no idea why this is doing this. I've never seen this problem before. I have no clue what is causing this. Stacking process just seems to be adding noise. the whole thing and start over again. So this will go back to a 60 second exposure. Well, that's okay. Yeah, so it's, it's, there's two votes for restarting sharp cap. I may end up doing that. Not a bad option. <coughs> yeah, no, CPWI definitely has quit. So I'm on either I'm gonna have to do a realignment to keep going. Time we'll just let this build.
Whoa, 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 whoa. Wow, okay. Now I can't even, now I can't even do any, okay. So I'm just going to have to uh, kill CPWI. Right, I'm just going to have to kill the whole thing here. Sharp cap gone. Okay, and you are completely disconnected. Let's try just firing up sharp cap again. It's already on the the mount is still tracking 42, so this may just be the end of the evening, but <clears throat> see if I can come back here and get some. Uh, okay. Mm. So it's now, s because CPWI is set up in hardware, as the ASCOM connection. Oh, and now I've lost my flat. Okay. Need my flats. Need my flat. Actually, I should be able to just reload. Load. Yeah, that's fine. Load, load, load. Okay, so you should be everything correct. <coughs> yeah. All right. Let's try going back to... Uh, what was I doing? I was doing it at 8 seconds. And so I need the dark for 8 seconds. And let's start the live stack. Let's just reset all of this. Bring our enhancements back. Yeah, see, and it's all coming in again. All this noise is coming in again. And it's all this stuff here on the edge of the histogram. I'm getting a bunch of noise from something. Hmm. I don't think it's CPWI somehow getting in here, but I'm not sure. <coughs> Hmm, hmm, hmm. Okay, well, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to redo the alignment and see if the problem goes through. The problem with sharp cap goes away because now I've got multiple problems happening here. CPWI disconnecting and now sharp cap behaving extremely strangely. So, I think that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to shut sharp cap off and I'm going to do a realignment here so let me go power cycle them out and do an alignment and see what happens
Okay, I have reconnected. Star Sense Auto Align. Ready. Uh, ready. Go. <clears throat> and we'll give. Um, to answer your question, Frank, yes, I do have the non beta also installed. I have 3.2 installed alongside 3.3. Um, and so I, that if if getting CPWI back to being happy again does not solve the problem, that will be the next thing I try. But I think it's a little bit of a coincidence that this started happening probably right about exactly the same time as CPWI lost its connection. And because SharpCap is ASCOM connected to CPWI as its hardware uh, connection, for mount control, I'm thinking maybe the two somehow interacted and CPWI perhaps screwed up the operation of SharpCap. So we'll find out here in a minute. As soon as we get done with the realignment. <coughs> Uh, Dave, the um, the breeze wasn't very strong. It was probably only six or eight mile an hour gusts, so not very strong. Um, but <clears throat> when you're doing, well, I don't I don't remember what object we were on, but I think I was only doing like eight or sixteen second subs, so um, it it doesn't really bother it that much. A 30 or 60 second sub would, would certainly be bothered. Um, <coughs> but um, so they were only probably about 6 or 8 seconds. Um, but it, it, because I'm on the wedge it makes the scope a little bit more precarious. Um, it, uh, let's see, where am I? Uh, I'm going to be in the northeast sky. Uh, let's just see if I can't move the scope right back to where we were. Um, because the scope is mounted on a wedge, it makes it a little bit more... It's not as solidly mounted as if the Altaz mount itself was on, you know, level. It's not quite as sturdy. So it does... Um, so it doesn't take a whole lot. It takes less of a breeze to jiggle it now than it did before. <coughs> okay. So, let's see where we are here. Let's load our dealio here. And um, okay, I gotta find my flats again. Oh, good, it remembered. Yay. Okay. Oh, huh, wonder why I didn't remember that. Okay, eight second, and I'm gonna need an eight second here. Okay, so every eight seconds looks like everything is good to go. 
So let's uh, start the live stack again at eight seconds. So let's see. Let's see what we can see. If we still get noise creeping in, or if it starts behaving normally again. Ooh, look at this. This is a bad sign. This is a bad sign here. What is all this at frass here at the at the edges? Hmm. Yeah, it's still it's still adding the noise. So I'm not sure what that's about. Okay, so it's still happening. So, let's close 3.3 three and open 3.2 and see if it's still happening in the full release version. I have a feeling it probably is going to be because it wasn't doing this earlier. So, I'm pretty sure it's going to still be doing it here too. But we'll see. Okay, so eight seconds, gain of three hundred flats. Yeah, let's get the flats re-put back in here. Come on. Open the folder, not rename. Okay. Just peg you for a second. Okay, and we've got the eight second flat, we've got the, the dark, we've got the flat, we've got the three hundred, eight seconds. Okay, I think I think that's everything being the same. Let's reset this and see what happens. <coughs> See, you can see it at the top end of the histogram, where it, it started to create a bunch of noise. Let's see if it comes up in this one. Hmm. Well, it does not seem to be doing it here. Let's put us here. Stretch us. Yeah. It does not seem to be doing it in 3-2. That's interesting. Huh. Let's do a color balance. No, it does not seem to be doing it in 3-2. That is very interesting. Hmm. Okay. It seems to be some 3-3 thing. 
Hmm, I wonder why it just started just now. That's odd. Oh well. No biggie. Guess I have a bug report to send to Robin about 3-3. Three, three. Uh, I could <laughs> go to this time in my video and you'll see what happened. <clears throat> Very interesting. Well, anyway, here is our M42. <clears throat> With again a couple of satellites photo bombing our image across the right across the bottom. <laughs> Stretch the heck out of it. The Big Winter Show, Ryan Nebula. Yeah, Al, I did well. Three, three. Maybe it is a bit less stable. Um, although I've had some good luck with it, and obviously tonight, you know, as you can, as you could tell, I was, uh, didn't have any issues with anything else. I don't know. Not sure. But, if it's something that I can repeat, then, uh, I'll have a bug report that I can file. But, I'm not sure why it would have been just doing it on M42 and not anything else. Who knows? The mysteries of software. This is why I'm not a software developer. <coughs> so, M42. Let's make sure that color balance is right. Yeah, I think it's pretty good. I don't really have a... I think it's a little yellow. I think the blue needs to go up a titch. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a bit better. And then, of course, the next step is to get trapezium. And the only trick to that is just reducing the exposure to the point where you can actually see them. <laughs> and zoom in on them, but for this first part we'll just do the, the big sexy. Which is what I call the M42 in the winter. Yeah, Dave, I'm sure I'm sure that's true. It's uh this is this is such a big, bright, spectacular object that like I said earlier, it's very hard to image. When you have both really faint parts and really bright parts, it's hard to get everything all in one exposure. <laughs> Either your exposure is set for the bright parts or it's set for the faint parts. But regardless of which, the other is not uh, not good. But there's you know, six or seven minutes on that, which I think is pretty good. 
<coughs> so now what we're going to do is we're going to stop the live stack and let's drop to just two seconds and start a stack at just two seconds. Now of course this you're going to have to put the histogram way out to get those central core stars. <coughs> Go away. <laughs> now this may actually be me not being in focus. I may actually this 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 actually looks like a focus problem. I'm thinking I may be out of focus. And I may have to go. I may have to go get a focusing star. Oh look, guess who's disconnected again? Okay, it reconnected. It usually does reconnect. Okay, um, let's go right out to Rigel, which is a great star to focus on. Oops, but first I need to, well, first I need to turn off live stacking, and I need to go to this. And there's Rigel. And so we will zoom in on Rigel, and I'll put the Batnov mask on, and we will uh, see about getting him focused. Okay, that is pretty darn, pretty darn good. Okay, let's move you back. Let's see. Go back to two seconds. Go back to our stack. Whoa, what the heck? Clear the old stack. Alright, get this out of the way. Let's see if we can zoom in a little better now. Maybe. Things still seem a little bit smudgy. Uh, a 
Frank asks if I have a screen near the mount to use for viewing while adjusting focus. Uh, yes, uh, because everything is right near the mount. Me and both laptops and the table and everything is right up against the mount. In fact, I think I showed that on my picture here. Yeah, so see, this table right here behind it, I'm sitting right there behind it. So laptops are here and all other equipment is on the end near the shed where the box is. You can see there's a green covered box back here. So yes, I'm sitting right there and the Batnov mask is inside this green covered box back there. So yes, everything is... I just uh, flatten out the screen. I just lay the screen back. Uh, I open the, the screen fully on the laptop so that I can see it from the other side of the table. And uh, and that's uh, how I how I'm seeing the adjustments as I'm making them because I'm right everything is right there <coughs> uh, I actually have tried doing some remote some remoting of um, <coughs> um, oh, wish it would stop doing this uh, I have actually tried to do some remoting uh, where I've remote controlled the setup and obviously when you're computer controlled um, you can do that See if I can clip the blacks here some. Um, when you remote control, you can, um, uh, when you're computer controlled, you can actually uh, do that. And uh, you, can, you now have the ability to, you know, remotely control a computer from a distance away using TeamViewer or Windows Remote Desktop or whatever. Um, you can actually kind of do that. So uh, I have tried working with that, but. The problem is the bandwidth to do that plus live stream is just too much traffic. There's too much traffic from my network, so it uh, it didn't work to live stream. If I'm just doing my own, um, if I'm just doing uh, my own evening, I'm, I'm not live streaming. I'm just doing astronomy for myself. I can control all of this using a Windows Remote Desktop from inside the house, no problem but trying to use all the traffic to do the remote controlling plus do the live stream is too much traffic and it just doesn't work. Um, last question, so if you're connected to the mount via Wi-Fi, how are you also broadcasting? Haha, <laughs> that's a very good question. Are you using a wired connection for internet and streaming? Okay, the answer to your second question is no. The answer to your first question is, I'm using two different Wi-Fi adapters. I have two, uh, obviously the laptop, my controlling laptop, has a Wi-Fi built into it, so it has a Wi-Fi adapter inside it. I then have a USB hub plugged into the laptop, which has a number of things plugged into it, including my mouse and um, the camera, etc., uh, the microphone that I'm using. Uh, but also, plugged into it, is a second Wi-Fi adapter. And Windows 10 can handle, even the home, Windows 10 Home, can handle more than one Wi-Fi adapter. And so, um, my internal adapter on the laptop is connected to my regular household Wi-Fi, and therefore the Internet. That's how I'm doing streaming, that's how I'm using my browser, etc. Uh, <clears throat> the second adapter is connected directly to the evolution mount, the, the Wi-Fi that's uh, internal to the evolution mount. And that is what CPWI is using to control the mount. So that was a handy little trick I picked up on the Cloudy Nights forum from the folks there that uh, I didn't even realize a computer could use more than one Wi-Fi adapter. Um, but they can in a very limited situation, which is as long as only one of the adapters is accessing the Internet and not two. You can't have two adapters accessing the Internet. If you have more than one adapter, only one can be accessing the Internet. The second one is a non-Internet connection. Basically, it has to be a closed network of some kind that does not have internet access because then the computer gets confused and doesn't know where to send stuff if everything if all more than one adapter is connected to the internet so in this case it's perfect because the whether you're using internal Wi-Fi on your mount or you're using a sky portal Wi-Fi dongle or whatever 
that basically is broadcasting just a closed, non-internet connected network, and so Windows 10 has no problem using both of them together. <clears throat> so, anyway, here is, here is my effort on trapezium. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I'm going to get it much cleaner than that. It probably would be better to try and do it in, in monochrome. Yeah, it's not going to make any difference. Um, 1.3, 1. 1. Where are you at? 1.4. Um, probably not going to make much difference to do uh, much, much better than that. But you can see at least 1, 2, 3, 4. Actually, this looks like there's a couple here. It's hard to. I'm right at the edge of my resolution for this camera, so um, it's not really designed to see. Um, <coughs> this one's not really designed to be high res. If I had my 178 mono in, I could probably pick these out much more cleanly. Dave asks, "Is my display 1080p?" Um, no, on this laptop, actually, this laptop is only at um, 1600 by 900 on this particular laptop of mine. Um, I actually, my monitoring laptop is actually a uh, Microsoft Surface Pro 3, which is several years old but still works great. And um, it actually has a screen that exceeds 1080p. So, um, uh, but but I can't broadcast at 1080p. I, I don't have, living out here in the middle of the desert, I'm lucky to be able to broadcast at 720p. Um, so I, I just can't, uh, I can't broadcast at, uh, at 1080. But anyway, there's my best shot at that. And Ollie, are you still on? You had requested M78 earlier. Um, if you're still on, say hi in the chat, let me know, and uh, we'll go take a look at it. Otherwise, I will probably call it a night, because I've been going for over two and a half hours, so almost ready to call it a night. But we did manage to get a little bit of trapezium. If I had my 178 mono in, uh, we'd get much better resolution on this, but 533 is designed much more for uh, <clears throat> for the big bright stuff. Okay. All right, Ollie. Well, you're still in, still here. So, uh, let's see. Well, let's use. Oh, <laughs> I don't have my sequence now. I'm in three two. Okay. Well, let's. Interesting. Let's. I'm gonna close. I'm gonna close this one. I'm going to try opening 3.3 again, and uh, let's, yeah, I know, I know all about it. Let's go to, eh, eh. okay, M78 was the request. Okay, oh, Casper, oh, I just did this last month, yeah, okay, this, w this was in the, uh, this was, yeah, I did this in my live stream last month, so this was in, uh, this was actually uh, in, in the challenge last month, and so I did this last month, but what the heck, I want to test, uh, I want to test the, uh, to see if that noise comes back again anyway, so let's, on a different target. Oh, look at you. Not wanting to reconnect. <laughs> God, this problem is just amazing. Come on. Okay, go away. No. Go away. All right. 
uh, the flat is applied. Um, 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 okay, let's load. Well, I can just. I think I can just do this. Let's go into the sequencer and start imaging. That should load the profile. 60 second, live stack, etc., etc., which should have everything I need. 60 second, yep, and it's going to write flat, yep, and 60 seconds, 300 gain, that's reset, yeah, so that should have everything. Okay, that should do it. Live stack alignment disabled due to non debayered raw frame. Yeah, see, that's some of the mysterious. For some reason, 33, the first, when you, when, you, when you put start live stack in a sequence, it dumps a garbage first sub into the stack for some reason. I'm not sure why that is, but. <coughs> Okay, Casper. There's our little Casper. Let's do an initial color balance here. <coughs> That's good enough for a start. Well, we don't seem to be having the noise problem we were having earlier, so that's a good thing. Not sure what was causing it, but I'm not unhappy that it's gone. <laughs> Yes, Casper. Casper, Casper. There's just two little eyes poking out. Do I have... I do not. Well, if you're just a mile or two away from a uh, an international airport, Ollie, you're uh, you're definitely trying to do EAA with a bunch of hands tied behind your back, because that's that's not that's not fun. To do any faint stuff would be virtually impossible because your background sky glow is so so bright. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate uh, appreciate you being here. Um, well, thank you for, <laughs> yeah, well, the real-time issues. I, I handle I handle real-time issues well when I'm prepared for them. And given the disconnects that I'm having fairly regularly with CPWI, I'm pretty much ready for this stuff to be happening. So, you know, it's the unexpected. When things blow up unexpectedly, that's, that's when I tend to get more wound up. But uh, in this case... You know, CPWI disconnecting on a regular basis seems to be what happens. And the stupid thing is still disconnecting, and I'll probably just leave it at this point, because this will be the last thing I do tonight anyway. Um, oh, and now it reconnected. <laughs> you know, so sometimes letting it sit for a minute, it'll reconnect. So, I don't know. I don't know. <coughs> well, thanks, Frank. I uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. I uh, 
This is supposed to be fun, right? Damn it. So, make it fun. Good night, Al. Thanks for stopping by. See you next time. You know, I did this last month. But I didn't do it at 60 seconds. I did it at 32. So, this might look a little bit different, I suppose. Because I just started doing 60 seconds last night. So, when I did the December challenge, where this was... this was, Yeah, because this was... Well, Ollie, didn't you do the December challenge? Seems to me that was your challenge, right? So this was in last month's. But I wasn't doing 60 second in, uh, exposures then. So this may look a bit different from what it, what I did last time. In fact, let's go look and see if I can see. If I can find where it was. Let's see. That would have been probably somewhere. Hmm. Oh, ha! <laughs> I'm looking for saved captures. <laughs> uh, when I'm doing live streams, I don't typically bother saving them. Now now that I have a, a, a sequence, now that I'm using the sequencer, which makes saving them really easy and automated, I save them. But uh, normally when I'm doing live streams, I don't bother saving any of my images because it's already a matter of record in the video. So... Um, yeah, so I can't compare it to the image I took last month because it was, uh, I did it during the live stream last month just as I, just as I did this month, so. So what is it over there, Ollie? Is it almost 9 o'clock for you now in the morning? I think that's about right. Eight hours? It's Wednesday morning for you. Still Tuesday for us. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's 9 p.m. Yeah, 7 a.m., right? 7 a.m. From my point of view, you are not too far from AF. What's AF? Oh, AP. Got it. Yeah, well, that's, that's the thing. It's uh, <clears throat> the lines between EA and AP are definitely blurring. <clears throat> ah, Astrophotographie, German, right? Yeah, the, the lines between EA and astrophotography are definitely blurring as cameras continue to get better and better, more and more sensitive, and allow us with much shorter subs and much less data collection to be bringing in incredible um, images like this you know with, with just you know five minutes or eight minutes or ten minutes of integration time it uh, and the software like SharpCap continues to get better and better and more powerful and more powerful the lines really are blurring between the two so yeah. It's uh it's definitely definitely blurring a bit. Speaking of which, how's my color balance? I think it's pretty good. Yeah.
think it was about right. And let's see, I can probably stretch that a little bit more, make it a little bit brighter without making it too noisy. <coughs> always a balance of pushing the stretch so that you s so that the live stream sees it well I have to completely blow it out on my screen to make it look good on your your end but lots of nice st structure in here though I don't think I got clear this nearly this amount of structure and detail last month when I did this at 32 seconds there's a lot more sharp structure in here that I don't think I got last time. So, thanks for recommending it, Ollie. I, uh, I'm liking it. Yeah, Dave, it seems, uh, for me, it seems to definitely increase the contrast. Um, it does seem to reduce background noise significantly, even though the 533 is a, is a very clean camera. It's not, it's not a noisy camera, but jumping from 30 to 60 seconds definitely increases the contrast. It definitely drops the noise levels um, a lot more on the integrations. So it uh, it seems to work pretty darn well. <coughs> I didn't think it would make... I expected everything to just get brighter. But... Not the case. So I guess there really is some... Uh, some... I guess there really is a, region, a reason that those astrophotography guys do the... Uh, do longer subs. It does make a difference. Now I know from way back when, when there were older, very noisy CCD cameras, you really had to use longer subs to overcome, to, to overwhelm the read noise of the sensor. But, you know, as we were saying earlier with the blur between astrophotography and EAA, as these camera sensors continue to get better and better and better, more and more sensitive, less and less noisy, just cleaner and cleaner and cleaner, less amp glow, no amp glow, uh, as they continue to get better and better and better, you're able to collect data in so much less time. So, <clears throat> even a 60-second sub on this, you know, on this 533, is probably the equivalent of a five or ten-minute sub on a, you know, an old CCD camera from six or eight years ago. So, EAA is now able to take images that are <laughs> amazing in just a short amount of time. The Helix, um, it's been, oh, I, I did shoot the Helix two or three months ago, um, and I think I did it with the 533, but I certainly didn't do it, I probably did it before I put the wedge, I put the Evo on the wedge, that was probably, um, when the heck did I shoot the Helix? Let me, uh, let me see if I can find it, because that one I would have saved. No items match your search. Mm. I have shot the Helix, but I don't remember. So, heart and soul, double cluster. 
Sculptor Skullville. Helix. Well, why didn't you find in the search? So I did the Helix back in the middle of November. Um, yeah, so that's what I got back in November for the Helix. Um, what? Let me look at that. What was I at? Was I using? Yeah, so it was the 533. Um... Okay, so that was 32 seconds. So yes, I have done the. So that was this was the helix done at 32 seconds, and obviously I was before I was using flats because I have this huge vignetting thing going on. Um, oh, and I forgot to put my. <laughs> anyway, um, so I have done the helix before, but I haven't done it at 60 seconds. Where is Helix? Let's see, are you still connected? You are connected. Helix Nebulon. Uh. Oh, yeah. Well, obviously not. <laughs> yeah, it has to. Be, that has to be something that. Uh, it sets at eight thirty. Yeah, so that is something I might be able to do right off early in the night, possibly. I might be able to do that one. But, uh, yeah, that would have to be something I'd have to do really early on. I did do it in November, but I, it was only at 32 seconds. So I've never tried it at... It's, pr pr it's probably too low for me. Well, let's back up. The beauty of doing the Stellarium is you can back up. Uh, let's back up to 8 p.m. and see where this thing is at, say, 7 p.m. Okay, at 8 p.m. It's barely above the horizon at 8 p.m. So, yeah, at 7, it's only, yeah, so, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's gone for me for the year. Yeah, that's not going to happen for me for the year. So, um, <clears throat> which is why I did it in November because it was getting low, and I wanted to get it before it disappeared for the season. So, you will have to tune in for my live stream in six months from now or so when it's coming up in the east. I'll have to get it then. <laughs> Yeah, well, th actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna need to call it a night. So, um, Casper is gonna be the Casper is the last thing that we're gonna do tonight. So, and I've got been on it for 18 minutes, so it's probably about time anyway. So, I am cold and I'm done. So I'm gonna actually head inside. So, I'm gonna end the live stream. But uh, thanks, guys, for showing up tonight. I really appreciate you all being here. It was uh, fun chatting with you and sharing, uh, well, the highs and the lows. We only had to realign twice, <laughs> but it did disconnect several times. So, anyway, um, thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. And uh, I will probably be doing another live stream here in the next uh, couple days or a few days. It just really depends on the weather. But uh, look out for my notices, and I'll... Uh, I will see you guys again soon. In the meantime, uh, I'm going to do this. There we go. Okay. Good night, everybody. <laughs>